So welcome everybody to uh, this week's uh, uh, seminar. Uh, we're delighted to uh, have uh, Professor Beata Sander, who will be speaking about forecasting PPE demand for Ontario. Beata. All right, thanks so much, Kumar. Um, so it's great to be here. Uh, Kumar actually said to have a lot of mathematics in there and I have no single equation in this whole presentation. So I hope it's not too disappointing from that perspective. But so I'll be talking about forecasting PPE demand for Ontario, and we focus on acute care hospitals. I would want to point out that this really is a study led by Kali Barrett. Uh, she can't be here today, but so I'll be presenting on behalf of the entire team. Um, where is my, sorry. Yeah. So this is the whole entire expanded COVID-19 kind of modeling uh, collaborative we have started early in, in March. And the people on the top row are the ones that are uh, involved in the PPE uh, modeling and planning, and then other people do all kind of other stuff. And I may talk about it just a little bit uh, while I'm up here. It's a group that outside of COVID-19, so it's mostly clinicians, uh, health services researchers, and modelers in the terms of doing decision analysis. So that's what we are usually doing. Many of us do, uh, decision analysis uh, looking at different clinical interventions. I, I'm personally focused on infectious diseases mostly around vaccines and many of us also do usually economic evaluation. So we build decision analytic models most of the time I would say Markov models unless it's within the infectious disease area where we for the most part build agent-based models and we use them to look at the effectiveness of different types of interventions and also at the cost effectiveness of interventions. Okay, so before I move into PPE, I did wanna talk uh, very briefly about CORE, the CORE model, which stands for COVID-19 resource estimator, because A, that's how it all started, and B, it's kind of at the heart of everything we do, and it's kind of providing the foundation as well for the PPE model. The timing is slightly unfortunate because we are right this week and next probably working really hard on updating the model, but I will talk about kind of the, the general principles and some of the key data that goes into it, knowing that it's going to change this week or next. So what this model looks like, it's a discrete time, uh, individual level health state transition model. But basically we have numbers of uh, patients presenting to the eMERGE. And then we kind of project forward uh, what is the patient flow through the hospital on an individual level. For uh, the time being, we also only looked at adults who are basically symptomatic with COVID-19 showing up at the emergency department. We follow them up for 60 days in daily time steps. And the perspective we are taking is that from a healthcare system. So for everything we look at in terms of health outcomes and we are thinking about adding cost uh, within the healthcare system. So that's the perspective. And there are three resource constraints built into that model, which are the ward beds, ICU beds, and ventilators. And then there's a whole range of outcomes we can look at and I'll get into more detail uh, a little bit later. But for the most part, we wanted to look at number of COVID-19 cases and mortality. And for mortality, we actually look at both mortality from COVID-19 for the patients that are admitted and kind of flow through the hospital, but also mortality that's attributable for because specific resources may not be available. So it didn't happen in Ontario so far, but we have seen in many other countries where they did run out of ICU beds and ventilators and which would increase mortality rates. So it's not just because of COVID-19, but potentially also because of resources are scarce. Um, so that kind of goes to the number of patients that need admissions, basically to the ward ICU or that need a ventilator. Uh, we could estimate how long does it take uh, given specific epidemic curves and specific growth rates in the epidemic. How long does it take until we run out of specific resources? or how many patients wait for any resources uh, per day. So basically we can look at the patient mix per day in the Ontario acute care system across the different locations where people can be in uh, eMERGE ward ICU and with and without ventilation. 
So the way it's laid out um, in terms of model structure is just what I said already. So uh, do you see the, the blue bubble? So basically pay individuals with COVID-19, I would say symptomatic COVID-19 infection show up at the eMERGE. And so there are new patients coming basically every day. They may be sent home to self-isolate or they may be admitted to a hospital uh, ward bed or straight to the ICU if they are severely sick. If they are in the ward, they, be, they can deteriorate and may need ICU admission later. If they are in the ICU, they may or may not need a ventilator. And so the way it's set up is that to get a ventilator, you also need an ICU bed. So there's a constraint there because you cannot have a ventilator without an ICU bed. You need to have both resources available. Uh, from the hospital ward bed, uh, you could be discharged. So if people would be admitted to ICU, they would go back to the ward before they're being discharged home if they recover. And of course, patients can die at any point and in any type of location. And the red, yellow, and brown kind of little bubbles are the resource constraints, which may or may not be available at any given point in time. There are a number of assumptions in there. One of the key um, assumptions is that basically symptomatic patients who need healthcare, they would all present at the eMERGE. So of course, patients may present in real life at a family physician, or they may present in an assessment center or somewhere else. But so in order to be, so to be admitted to hospital, they would have to go through the eMERGE. So we kind of simplified that step a little bit. If resources are not available, patients will remain wherever they are now. So if a work bed's not available, they will stay in the eMERGE. If an ICU bed's not available and they are in the eMERGE currently, they stay there. If they are currently in the ward, then they stay there. So basically, they stay wherever they are. Ventilators and ICU beds are freed up uh, if a patient recovers and is discharged from the ICU or is taken off the ventilator or if patients uh, die and ward beds are freed up uh, when patients recover. So that was actually in the older version where there was not a lot of evidence that people would die in the ward. With the update, we include that patients can also die in the ward, which, which happens. So, so they will also be freed up upon death of patients. In terms of priority setting, it's fairly simple. So uh, ward beds are basically allocated to ICU patients first if they are being discharged from ICU. And the reason for that is that we will, ICU beds are the, the most limited resource, ICU bed and ventilators. So we wanna free up those. And so ICU patients that need to be discharged from ICU will get the ward bed first over patients that are new admissions. And then all the other resources are distributed uh, by wait time. So whoever waited the longest since they were admitted, which worked well for the model where we, like the Ontario situation, where we didn't really need to triage patients because we didn't truly totally run out of patients. We have had discussions around potentially including more sophisticated triage models. And so the the saying of pa how patients are prioritized so in real life, it's quite complex. So that would require a lot more data, which so far it's not really quite all that available. So for the time being, this is how we kind of set it up. Patients that are waiting for an ICU bed have the same mortality rates as someone who is already in the ICU unless they need a ventilator. So if someone needs a ventilator and none is available, basically patients cannot survive. So they will die within 24 hours. And that's primarily where the access, where the uh, increased mortality comes from due to uh, not resources not being available. This is some of the data and that's fresh as of uh, last night. So I just put it in. So that's the way we update the model now. We haven't done, and that's why it says under construction. So we have now a whole lot of um, Canadian data and also more data from the UK in terms of the probability that patients need hospital admissions, ICU care, ventilation, how long they stay in wards um, and ICU with, without ventilation, how long are they on mechanical ventilation, uh, length of stays uh, in the ward before and after ICU admission and probability of death in the different locations. And so in the, for the first version of our model, we relied a lot on international data, including data that was not specifically for COVID-19, but for 
patients with acute respiratory distress syndrome, which is similar but not the same. So now we do have, so IFIS is the Ontario Reportable Disease Data, Public FAC is Public Health Agency of Canada data, CCSO is Critical Care Services Ontario. The only other data that's not from uh, Ontario or Canada is the ICNARC. So that I actually, and I have to admit, I can't remember off the top of my head what it stands for, but that's uh, ICU data from the UK. So they report uh, weekly, um, uh, very detailed on what is going on. And the patient population is actually quite similar. So, so the data lines are very well. But as I said, it's under constructions because we are calibrating still the model, some of the data. In terms of calibration and validation, again, like I uh, said, it's under construction. So that's happening actually this week, where uh, we calibrate some of the length of stay data uh, to projected occupancies of ICU and work beds. And so in the old version, it compared really, really well. So we were able to calibrate it incredibly well, actually. It looked really good. And so we are redoing it right now. And so the occupancy rate is basically how many people are in a, you know, how many beds are occupied in a hospital on a given day. And it's really a function of predicted number of cases, probability of that someone is being admitted to the ward and then to the ICU. How long is someone staying in a bed? Uh, the probability of death and to some degree the prioritization was. So the occupancy rate actually cover kind of a wide range of different variables. And so matching that's actually really quite good. So what's been always really challenging, I think we have a lot of data in terms of, well, we have a reported number of cases and symptomatic cases, and then we have data within the healthcare system. But so the connection is where things are really a little bit tricky, where we have not really good data from who is symptomatic, you know, what proportion of symptomatic patients has some kind of healthcare contact and where do they have it? So to kind of connect the epi piece to the healthcare system piece, that's where it's quite challenging. This is just a picture of what we had done earlier from the early version of the model that's published. So we were able to match it actually really quite well, which um, like I said, like with all the different variables going into it and length of stay was a bit tricky. So, but yeah, so that's happening right now. In terms of scenarios, this is just like a um, very high level overview of what we would usually run. We have come up with some kind of scenarios for a predicted number of cases over the next 60 days. And we usually would just use that, basically do a very simple prediction based on our data so far. Uh, in the very beginning, we also looked at other countries of how things may look like. So that was very early March when we had no real data where we said, okay, worst case scenario is kind of like, like Italy, so this type of thing. And then we have different scenarios in terms of what we have available in, uh, in terms of healthcare resources. And so for all of Ontario, but then also for each of the five different regions, Central, East, North, uh, Toronto, and West. So those are the five health regions in Ontario. And so that would be kind of like the typical, I would put some, just some highlight in terms of how long is it going to take until we kind of run out of different types of resources and different types of scenarios. And I don't want to go to it because that's kind of still from the older model, but I think what's uh, where it now links into the PPE modeling and that's why I kind of want to talk about what I said earlier, the number of patients per day in the different locations in a hospital and with and without ventilation. And the other thing that I did not yet talk about is we also can get the output now by day of admission because we follow each patient over time. So we know whether it's day one, two or three or whatever day of their admission. And that's important for all the PPE modeling because the type of care patients get on, especially on day one, but also day two compared to once they kind of settled in uh, in the hospital is very different because there's so much in terms of work up that's happening in the very beginning and it has different PPE requirements so it's actually quite important to know uh, which day of their admissions the patient are in. And that's going to lead me to the PPE prediction modeling. I know if there are any how you guys deal with questions. I'm happy to take that in between, but maybe easier at the end. Yeah, normally we have the questions at the end. 
yeah okay because it's hard to see for me too it's so much easier all right so um specifically for this project and I, I focus on a specific project even though we always kind of do different um simulations for different uh, stakeholders but so in general so it's more of a general kind of um project where we try to forecast near term which is up to 60 days ppe demand in ontario's acute care sectors and obviously during COVID 19. and there are two different types of studies we have done so one the first one is we called provincial level study so that's using provincial PPE recommendations. And then we have a hospital level case study, I'm gonna talk about that a little bit, which has different PPE policies. So PPE policies in the big scheme of things can be universal across a whole institution, or they can be per touch point. And what that means, a touch point is basically anytime a healthcare worker enters a patient's room or it or there's some kind of procedure that requires PPE. And so you could imagine that there is a number of touch points per day, per patient, per different type of healthcare worker. And so Ontario's provincial PPE recommendations that are uh, published by Public Health Ontario are per touch point. So they do not consider the universal part, so they're only per touch point. And then what we noted uh, once kind of, um, especially at the time when PPE was getting very limited and people were getting a bit scared, the hospitals really started implementing their own institutional policies, which differed quite a bit from the PPE recommendations that were given out by PHO. And so for the most part, uh, the policies that Ontario hospitals implemented included universal wearing of surgical masks, then conservation efforts that are required to reuse or use specific PPE equipment for longer during a specific shift. And so that would mostly affect surgical masks, face shields, and N95 masks. And then there's also what's called the individual point of care risk assessment which allows the healthcare worker to say, okay, this is a risky procedure, or this is a more high risk contact, and I will need a N95 mask instead of a surgical mask. So this is something that's um, part of the provincial recommendation. And so this could actually kind of change um, the uh, utilization of N95 mask quite a bit. And that's mostly, I say, based on really, you'd say, human behavior, fear, you know, what is going on. So basically, the healthcare worker would have the, the opportunity to say, whatever the procedure is, this is high risk, and I want an N95. Okay, so provincial level study, provincial PPE recommendations, hospital level case study uh, is some kind of adjustment of the um, provincial policy with universal masking and conservation strategies. So it's kind of institutional ones basically doing both, uh, using more masks in terms because of the universal strategy, but then also trying to conserve utilization by reusing or extended use. So uh, methods in a nutshell, so again, it's our health system, health system modeling appeared uh, informed by a lot of empirical data collection. And I will talk a little bit about that. So we did collect data at UHN and Mount Sinai hospitals. Um, and so our model overall will take into account uh, COVID-19 epidemic trajectories. So what's the expected number of patients that kind of moved through the healthcare system? So again, that's part of the core model where we have the acute care pathway for COVID-19 patients through the eMERGE world ICU with, uh, without ventilation, but then also the day one, two, or three or more uh, of admission. We now look at the acute care patient mix. So not only COVID-19 positive patients, but also person under investigation or PUIs and uh, COVID-19 negative patients. Then we look at healthcare workers' practice patterns, uh, what are the numbers and types of those touch points, and that's where our empirical study really comes in. And then we also look at the different PPE policies so that we can calculate what type of PPE bundles or packages needed for the different types of touch points. 
uh, by uh, contact, uh, type of contact or risk level and the types of policies. So the way this plays out, so uh, again, in a nutshell, it's about patient volume, uh, different touch points uh, and staffing, uh, the acute care hospital in the acute care sector, and then what type of standards are needed. So I'm gonna start with the provincial level study. So that's uh, kind of what we did, that's what we did first, where we used the quarter model I just introduced earlier in the talk to predict a daily number of COVID-19 cases that are showing up at the eMERGE being admitted to the hospital ward or ICU with or without ventilator. And so we looked at reported data to then also come up with for each uh, COVID-19 positive patients, how many uh, other patients would be a person under investigation. So in this model, we only include COVID-19 and PUI. This is because it's the provincial policy is per touch point for COVID-19 positive and PUI patients only. So where COVID-19 negative patients would not need PPE. To estimate the touch points that I mentioned that already, that's why we did an empirical study at UHN and Sinai. So basically what we did, we observed patients and healthcare workers in different locations in the eMERGE in the world and in the ICU over a period of time and took note and basically took note of how many touch points there are over that period of time for the different patients in the different locations and by different types of healthcare workers. So it'd be different for for physicians to nurses to respiratory therapists. So we had a wide range of types of healthcare workers that we covered with that study. And then we kind of went back and we did interviews with management across uh, the hospital. And then we did actually a second round. And that second round was incredibly important because behavior changes quite rapidly. And maybe because it was earlier in the pandemic, and it was around the time when we did the first, uh, the first study when we observed um, healthcare workers and patients. It was around that time, close around the peak, and when we thought PPE, we are gonna run out of PPE basically. And so what happened was that healthcare workers really changed how they practice. And that's incredibly important in terms of PPE use. So things they did, I kind of minimized uh, pa direct patient contact or minimize how off the touch points really. So they did start to use cell phones or baby monitors or some kind of intercom to communicate with the staff inside the patient room or with the patient. They did stuff like extending the IV tubing so medication could be administered from outside the room so you don't need to go inside the room. They started bundling up or coordinating different uh, patient tasks. So also again, to kind of go into the room, but maybe for a longer period of time and do a whole range of different things and not go in like, you know, a couple of times uh, separately. And so again, like all those things have huge impact on PPE utilization, mostly because all the PPE, unless you're in a conservation uh, strategy, is only gonna be used once, right? So they use it every time they go in and then it's gonna be thrown out. So staffing was not important for this because all the PPE was calculated per touch point. And then they used the provincial PPE recommendations basically to say for each patient contact that depends on patient COVID-19 status, so positive or PUI, and uh, the risk level of AGMP, which is aerosol generating uh, medical procedures, and there could be non low or high risk. Um, we have a specific bundle of PPE that's being used. In our study, we did consider proning, which is turning a ventilated patient onto their tummy, basically, as a low-risk AGMP, which is not included in the PHO guidelines, but so that's what basically all institutions do. So that's um, a kind of general recommendation. So we did include that as an AGMP, and AGMPs require a higher level of PPE, and I will get to that too. So that's the kind of based on the provincial 
policies and in terms of PPE use and for touch point. Then when we went to the institutions, because we were really interested in how it all plays out when institutions change their policies and don't follow exactly um, the PPE recommendations by PHO. So we did a UHN case study between April 7 and 16. So that was kind of around the peak time where we looked. And so here we don't get the number of patients from the model. We actually looked at the real patient flow, number of patients, within UHN uh, that are COVID-19 positive, PUI or COVID-19 negative, who were assessed in the eMERGE then admitted to the ward or at ICU with and without ventilation. So here we also include COVID-19 negative patients. Again, we looked at the number of touch points, so that was exactly the same data that came that we used for the other study. But then we also looked at UHN staffing. So again, in the, within this case study, then we looked at how many clinical and non-clinical employees basically work at the hospital per day. So what's the staffing um, for each of the different units? And so again, we looked at ED, ICU, and ward. Uh, how many physicians? How many? There were not trainee, no trainees at the time in the hospital. But how many physicians? How many nurses? How many respiratory therapists? and how many non-clinical employees are going to the hospital. And that's important for the universal kind of masking strategy. So how many people basically walk through the door. And so in terms of institutional PPE policy, there was a PPE allocation per day for non-clinical and clinical staff, and it's stratified by the location of work. And then in addition to that, you also have the PPE use per touch point. So it's a combination of the two, but it's a little bit uh, different because they do have the universal masks already. Okay, so this uh, table is just giving the overview of kind of what the PPE bundles are. The lighter blue grayish color on the left is what is the PPE recommendation by PHO. So that's the provincial one where we have high risk and low risk AGMPs. Uh, then generally uh, COVID-19 positive patients and COVID-19 negative patients. And so we have a range of basically a bundle for each of those groups that may consist of surgical mask or N95 uh, gloves or extended gloves if it's a high risk AGMP, face shields, uh, face shield with a drape, gowns or level one, uh, not in this case, there are no level one masks. And then on the rate side, we basically have the institutional PPE policy. And so if you go all the way to the right, you can see for ICU, emergency department stuff, other clinical stuff and non-clinical stuff, what the allocation was. So we get two surgical masks for the most part per day, one N95 mask for ICU, NED stuff and so on. But then, so basically you get those things and you're expected to use them for the whole entire day. So that's kind of where it comes in with it's a universal policy, so everyone kind of gets something, some of the mask type of uh, face covering, but then you have to use it for the entire shift. And so that's because you use those for the entire shift, you don't need then the per touch point mask. So you're saving them per touch point. And so there's uh, some uh, basic results in terms of 10-day uh, demand, 30-day demand, 45-day demand, and 60-day demand. So it's not, uh, I think, I guess not like that super excited, uh, the exciting. The 10-day demand is for around the peak. So you can see that even if you go from the 10 to the 30-day demand for the different bundles, it's not exactly times three, just because the first period of time was during the peak and then uh, after the peak, obviously after the epidemic peak, then usage would go down uh, that, and that would be the usage per touch point. So that's based on a provincial level study. And if you look at it from a provincial perspective, I just think the numbers, I'm still kind of shocked every time I see those numbers, that it's all in the millions uh, in terms of supply that's needed within a 10 day period. It seems just incredibly high to me, but so it just basically is what it is um, across the different categories that make up the PPE bundles. Now moving on to the hospital level study. So now that's a little bit different, right? So we had 
we've done, I show you the results over the 10 day period. Again, so it kind of aligns more or less uh, with the epidemic peak where the first column is estimating mass uh, PPE bundles or PPE use uh, according to the institutional policy. And again, this is only now for UHN. So that's why the numbers are uh, quite a bit lower over a 10 day period. And then if UHN had followed provincial recommendations, that's in the second column. So the first is with universal masking and conservation strategies. Second column is following provincial recommendations and I also put the incremental. So what's really staggering here is what, how incredibly different the numbers are. So that following institutional policies, it's almost three times, it's about three times as high in terms of surgical mask uh, demand or use compared to provincial recommendations. And so obviously because the universal masking as well as the conservation strategy, so that's all related to surgical masks, N95s, and face shields, and then the level one mask. So the gowns, gloves are not affected by it. But I think what is interesting here that despite the conservation strategy and, so, and the fact that you no longer kind of use all those masks for each individual patient touch point, so basically that cannot, are nowhere near offsetting the demand that, some, that the hospital would have just based on a universal masking strategy. And so this is during a time where many patients uh, were, were, you know, during the peak. So I would, so in general, you would expect that if universal masking um, is a good kind of strategy if you want to and, and conservation strategies is kind of good during the peak and it's per, it's even um the differences would be even greater when there were fewer patients with COVID-19. It does save N95 masks though so it, and N95s were particularly in very very short supply for us for some period of time. And I think I will get to that later in the conclusion but I, it's just really you know just looking at those numbers uh, basically, this type of policies really need to be taken into account if you're planning for PPE, uh, especially now for the fall, where there's a lot of planning on the way. So we cannot just go with what the provincial recommendations are because then we for sure are going to run out of PPE. So it's very important to actually look at what's going on within the different institutions. And this figure is just showing the same thing uh, in a graph, uh, except that now we have the three different colors are showing the institutional level analysis, which is consistent with the table I just presented. But then it's kind of um, yellowish is uh, an ICU and ED level analysis, so only in the ICU <clears throat> or emergency department. And then the dark blue is within the ward. And so it's focusing on the PPE elements that are affected by institutional policy, which are the level one mask, surgical mask, face shields, and N95. And so you can see that basically on an institutional level, we need more of everything except for the N95. Whereas if you look at um, uh, ICU and even the ward, uh, we are preserving surgical masks and face shields. Um, and also uh, N95 uh, in the ICU and in the eMERGE. So, I, so there, there are trade-offs. We're going to need way more surgical masks and we need more on an institutional level, but we would need less uh, within the eMERGE in the eMERGE in the ICU. So in summary, I'd say so PPE requirements uh, are quite substantial and I think it's uh, so uh, policies that are aimed, what I said previously, at reducing the spread within institutions, uh, such as universal masking, may result in substantial increases in PPE demand. And it's unlikely that it's offset by the conservation strategies that were implemented at the same time. We think when the risk of community or nosocomial spread is low, the so spread within the hospital, universal masking may actually uh, unnecessarily deplete scarce resources, but it may make more sense when the rate of community spread are high. But even in that situation, uh, it's the increased demand by the universal strategy is not offset by the conservation strategy. So there will be still a net 
increase in what we need in terms of PPE. And it's obviously, I think, the very important that when we think about supply chains and PPE procurement, that we need to be uh, very considerate of not only our local epidemiology, but also of practice patterns and policies, especially institutional policies that differ from provincial recommendations. I think I want to conclude with some key principles that I think are really important in terms of PPE prediction modeling. I think it's incredibly important to understand, obviously, the complexities of infectious diseases and health system modeling. So some of some of this stuff um, the, is prediction. I think some of what I showed today, the hospital study was um, retrospective. So we could see how different policies in real life would have Im would impact our PPE needs. But generally we do perspective and we do prediction. So we do need to understand uh, what the infectious disease epidemiology may look like over the next while and also understand how the patient flow to the hospital happens in, in the model and what the limitations are. You need to understand for sure what the healthcare culture is, what are the practices by healthcare workers and how they use PPE and how that's all gonna change over time. I think one thing that we saw in our studies really is how people change behavior and we couldn't include everything, but that would be something really interesting to also include in some more sophisticated modeling human behavior and human factors and so if people get scared and um, are worried about their own health and protection then healthcare workers will for sure use more PPE and that's important and as I'm not saying we, they should not um, I'm saying it's also we need to plan for this. I think it needs to be to, in some point really based on empirical data, which just reiterating what I just said, that we need to know how healthcare workers practice and how that's changing over time. And that also leads to the last point that we need to keep updating and validating it. And so that's where you have like multiple rounds and kind of keep going on it. Uh, for anyone who is interested, we do have two online tools, one very basic model that's uh, only based on the provincial recommendations. And we now have a beta version on uh, our website that also that kind of looks at both. So we could have uh, kind of the institutional policy per that includes universal and conservation strategies as well as uh, touch points. So that's um, also in a publication that's forthcoming. And we also did PPE forecasting in other settings. We did long-term care a while back, and we are right now working on home care as well to inform policy on that. And I think that's it, and I'm finishing super early. I'm not used to <laughs> having a lot of questions in between. So thank you. Thank you, Beata. That was a very interesting talk. I think. Uh... Uh, it was interesting to see, you know, many of the talks in this seminar are, are just present a, a bunch of equations. And then, <laughs> and then, I, I don't have equations, Kumar, I'm sorry. No, 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 I, I know a really easy math. It's just, a, I think once you get to the PPE, it's just addition and multiplication. But. I, I was actually going to try to say that it was a good thing because uh, behind all those graphs and those numbers are real people. And this year mm -hmm. talk brought us closer to the front lines of both the healthcare workers and the patients. So it was, yeah. it's, I think it's important to keep that perspective in mind for anybody working in this field. Uh, I think John Hong will conduct the Q&A, but I had, a, if we don't mind, I, I would like to ask the first question. Is that okay, John Hong? Of course, you're the chair. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one curious thing is in, in an early slide where you showed um, a bunch of parameters that you estimated, you gave numerical values for various parameters and, uh, quite early in the... Yeah, from the core model, I think. What yeah. are you updating right now? Yeah, uh, this shows my ignorance, but uh, what, what was curious here is there, that, that slide, yeah. What's curious here is that um, the probability of death for ICU patients with ventilators is higher than ICU patients without ventilators. Does that mean that by the time they need, a, they need ventilation, they're probably nearly dead or something? Well, they're just more severely sick, right? Mm -hmm. So I think once you reach the point where you need ventilation, your disease is more progressed, you're more sick, so you're more likely to die. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. so I see. I see there are other questions. 
So before I ask question, maybe I can, I want to thank again, uh, Beata for coming here. So now we have the both chairs of the Ontario Modeling Consensus table here. And Beata, I just want to tell you that there are two mathematical models, those who know the equations and those who know the numbers. So you are, you are bring us uh, the second dimension. Uh, thank you very much. So I have a question about the PPE. So you, you mentioned N95 is the most uh, uh, precious uh, product in Ontario. And uh, so that doesn't mean that the regular masks are relatively easy available or you can use homemade. And so is there any strategy that uh, to really encourage the use of the, the other masks to reduce the infection in the community and you know, in the healthcare setting, and therefore you will reduce the need for N95 mask. It's kind of game theory. Yeah. So, so what? Sorry. What can you repeat? Like what the question is, John? So home? I just feel if the resources is uh, in terms of investment into the mask is limited, and I know yeah. um, the 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 demanding to N95 in the healthcare setting is is higher. Um, so maybe the a strategy is to invest on the communication to encourage behavior change in the community, in the public, to encourage them to wear the mask and therefore to reduce the infections and therefore reduce the need of the healthcare capacity. Yeah, I think that's that. That's right. It's, so you're talking about community. Uh, I think masking within the community, which is a strong recommendation now, but not um, not by law everywhere at least. So I think that it, you know. So I think it's kind of like almost two different topics. So I'm very supportive, obviously, of having uh, masking uh, in the community. And we know that the level one mask or surgical masks are more than you know sufficient to do that. I think that um, within the hospital, so it's, it's, I'm not sure. So if the, um, how do I frame that? I think if the, um, if basically if transmission is low in the community, we also have a lower risk within hospitals uh, for, uh, you know, someone bringing in uh, the infection, the potentially lower risk of nosocomial infection. But I then, so the fewer patients there are obviously the less PPE you need overall because the N95s are really just needed, are really needed for COVID-19 patients and for very specific procedures. So mostly HMP, which is related to ventilation, all the type of procedures. But so the fewer patients, the less we need of those. I think that's still like, I can't remember the, now it, it's in one of these slides, right? So. This still kind of is, is very striking to me, just what the differences are in terms of uh, what that differs by policies within the hospital, really, where the N95 masks that were in very short supply at some point, and that's when we started the conservation strategies where you got one or two per day and you had to use it for the whole entire shift. So that clearly, once you have a conservation strategy, it will reduce the utilization, but we also had the large increase in surgical masks that are needed just be, because of the universal policies. And so I think sometimes I find it hard to present this type of work actually because it seems like we shouldn't do it, which is not the message I want to send. I think actually, the, you know, it's more about planning and it makes sense to have universal masking policies in the community, but also within the hospital. And so that whoever enters the hospital is wearing a mask. So that's part of the universal strategy. I would, I think the message I want to get across is that this is something we absolutely need to plan for. And if you plan uh, supply and want to make sure we have enough in the stockpile, we cannot just go with provincial recommendations because they do not include the universal policies. So it's just, patient touch points. I'm, I realize I kind of keep talking around a bit, but 
thank you, Abiata. I, I appreciate. It. I know how difficult to to inform both the public and inform the mm -hmm. the, the government. Uh, I have uh, Abdul Kadia Hossein um, raised the hand. Uh, uh, Hossein, you want to talk, um, ask a question directly? Oh, thank thank you very much, uh, Jin Hong. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. It's a very interesting talk, and. Uh, I'm in, involved in a project where we are trying to look at the uh, uh, culture of supply chain in, in hospitals and, and related to the COVID-19. So it's very interesting to me. So one, one question is that, did you consider the actual numbers of infection rates among the healthcare workers? Because ultimately uh, provincial or institutional policy um, doesn't matter in the face of uh, rates of infection among health workers. So did you connect the numbers there on the ground to, to your model? No, we were not able to do that. And this, the point is also that once you have a universal policy in place, you actually don't really need that because then everyone would be wearing a mask basically all the time, right? So I, but it's a really great point in terms of how to also, again, like it always comes back to looking at institutional policy and how they address all those concerns. And that I think to just go with, to just do calculations or predict the demand based on a touch point is not going to be good enough. And if we do that, we are vastly underestimating of what the need is going to be. But so, yeah, so the, the short answer is no, we could not get that information. Uh, the longer answer is like if there is a universal policy in place, then it probably doesn't matter too much because everyone would be wearing masks all the time already. And then as soon as infections, usually, so if once the healthcare worker tested positive, they would have had to stay home for a while anyway. So, or mm -hmm. even if they were under investigation. Yeah. Which which also depends on how often they are tested, but exactly, we, yeah, we don't know that. Either, so. Yeah, I think if you if you would want to minimize the risk, then we basically need everyone to wear a mask all the time because we will never know, right? You know, when someone is infected and it's asymptomatic, unless they had contact with a patient who is positive and they kind of know and being tested, and so there are a lot of ifs. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I agree. I think if you know if we want to take that into account, we have to assume universal policies. Yeah. So, so my my uh, second question is the about the tools that you developed. Mm -hmm. So so those tools are you say they are uh, publicly available. Are, are they uh, like written in R or something like that? Is it a package? Yeah, it's a shiny app. Both of them are shiny apps. Um, we or we just posted we didn't promote quite yet the second one which i think is the better one that has the institutional policies mm -hmm. because it's still a beta version but it's in the slides and i'm happy to share the slides and send the link like it's not a price i think it's fine to use so everything that we improve now it's more in terms of usability and we actually just had a meeting today with people that tried it out so we got a lot of feedback into you know rename this give more a kind of detail on how to use that but the, the mathematics behind it, like that's all fine. So it's more usability that we are testing right now. That's why we didn't kind of push it out yet uh, broadly. I see. But it's available and it can be used. Yeah. Okay. So you will have to, you will need some information on in terms of how many patients do you have on average in a day in your hospital in the different locations, what proportion is COVID-19 positive and so on. And what are the PPE uh, bundles and it's pre-populated with kind of data that we have from our study, but you could change all of that. Okay. Do, do you use the, the SEER model anywhere there or you're putting like a forecast of uh, the numbers of COVID in, in the locality? Which model? Like the, uh, the, the epidemiology um, dynamics of the COVID-19. Yeah, so Has we back to anywhere in, in your model or it has to be user defined and uh, so it so in the in the more complicated words that, that or i think what i think the model that includes the institutional policy we did not build in the epi epidemiology so you would have to define basically how many patients within your hospital are going to be COVID 19 positive 
Mm -hmm. And so you could run different scenarios and you could kind of piece it together. That was part of the discussion we had today. It's kind of really hard to balance the different types of potential users. So some want to have everything ready. And mm -hmm. so one thing we may include is like, what if there's a 5% increase in positive cases, which we had in the old version, like an increase and you can set up what, the, what that rate of growth rate is. Mm -hmm. In the new version, you just say, okay, if this is your proportion of patients that are positive or under investigation, that's what you need over the next 10 days. And so you could imagine, you say, you know, if maybe over the next three months, we're going to have a peak. So we're going to have whatever proportion patients positive and you calculate those numbers. And maybe during the non-peak time, that's the proportion and kind of put it all together. So it's possible to do that. It, it's a little more flexible that way. Yeah. Uh, I, I, but I can see your point. Yeah, with the kind of trying to figure out how to balance the needs of the different potential users. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. I have many, many other questions, but maybe I'll contact you <laughs> privately because there are a lot of people uh, in line. So thank yeah. you. Always uh, feel free to reach uh, out. Hussein, you can, you, can, you can reach out uh, directly. Um, the next one is my friend, uh, Professor Mesu Ifendi. Uh, Mesu, are you on the line? Okay, yes. The, the, uh, just yesterday, I looked CNN, and then they uh, uh, spoke about the shortage on PP bundle in the United States, and this is therefore the, the topics which you choose is very important. Thank you very much. My question is, the, uh, is uh, oriented uh, in direction of mathematical modeling. How big is the difference between uh, predicted PP bundles with your model and provincial authorities which giving you? <laughs> I would love to know. Um, I, I, so I think what happens is that we do present to uh, decision makers, but what I don't know is what, uh, what they do with it, right? So, what, so if you ask me about the difference, honestly, I don't know. I think generally the consensus is- higher or lower? Sorry? Could we hire? Yeah, I don't really know. I, I really don't know. I think this is something we put out there just because from my initial understanding was that a lot of the initial prediction uh, was based on the provincial recommendations. And so what we show with this work is that, in fact, in real life, it may be way higher, as much as three times as high for surgical masks. And that's a huge difference. Mm -hmm. And especially if supply is limited as well, uh, then, then that's a big problem. Mm -hmm. I do think that since the initial models that I have seen that the ministry is using, they have changed it and they also is, have uh, included now universal masking strategies. How it exactly looks like, I honestly don't know because they say like, I, you know, I'm every now and then I present, but I don't know what they're going to do with it. So, so I, I don't know. I would love to know too. I, I just want to uh, share with you, Masu. My feeling is the government does not want to base on the decision on a single model, and uh, they don't want to give the credits to any mother, but also don't want to blame any <laughs> uh, potential uh, mistake on any mother. But I know Beatrice's work is very influential. And I think that, so especially for the PPE, because it's not only acute care. So like I said, we focus on acute care. We also have done long-term care now the home care sector. But I know they con the ministry did contract this out to consulting companies, uh, different um, different consulting companies that look at the entire use. So they also look at what is needed for the police or for, you know, for uh, distributing masks um, on the TTC or, you know, whatever it is, uh, planning for school opening and what do they need for schools and teachers and this and that. So they cover all sectors. So I would uh, probably not expect that they have the same level of detail that we have within the healthcare sector just because they cover all the different sectors. But they, they, those are business consultancy groups that basically do those predictions in terms of demand and supply chain management. Mm -hmm. Other questions and comments? So 
if if I can, if nobody asks, I, I would like to know. Uh, you, uh, you know, in I am from Germany. In Germany, we have the, the very good infrastructure as far as concerned the DPP bundle. And they are, according to Robert Koch Institute, which is responsible for all these things, the, 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 the main idea is they are taking difference between uh, 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 regional difference as far as concerned the PPA bundles. How about in the in Ontario? So uh, yes, yeah, so all I know is that so at the provincial level it's planned provincially and like again I you know from what I know is that they initially planned based on those provincial recommendations and then added some universal utilization to it. I I'm not aware of that planning is regional within Ontario. So on part of all this is, you know, this is kind of why we did all this work as well, because we do think it's important to take into account how the different institutions adapt to what the supply may be, how they change their policies and how this may differ in different institutions. So not even regionally, but different hospitals also have different types of patients, they have different patient volume and it differs over time. So, so Putting this out there, I would hope it's also kind of helping uh, users to do their own predictions for sure. And then kind of feed it back up, right? So now, so someone in a hospital, a hospital administrator could use a tool and kind of come up with those predictions. And even within hospitals, I'd say like in the very beginning, a lot of the predictions were based on the past and they were very static and they didn't really into take into account what the increase may be over time. So that was very early on in the pandemic. I think everyone now kind of adopted to it. But what has been under underestimated, I think, is the change in human behavior and how we adapt to risk and how we perceive risk. And if the news today is, like you said, uh, I mean, what's going on in the US now, and yes, CNN and others reported, like PP is a huge topic now again in the US because there's so many cases, right? And so it may come back to Canada. So this kind of fear and that may change healthcare workers behavior and change what they actually need, which may be very different from what we predicted. I think that's been underappreciated overall and how probably also hospital administrators sometimes do have a lot of pressure and say, well, you know, healthcare workers need to be protected. So, so you can't really say no to a lot of those things. Um, you know, some healthcare workers, if the nurse saying like, this is a high risk procedure, I need an N95 for this, you're not gonna say no, right? So I, I think that's been what's, from my perspective, that's what's been underappreciated overall, how people change over time. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, you said you have an agent-based model too, right? Mm -hmm. so that would be able to incorporate behavioral uh, um, yeah, so maybe I didn't, I think, so, so what we've done, so right now what it's, you know, done is the, um, it's an agent-based model that's just looking at the uh, acute care system, but we are also working on an agent-based model that's, uh, we're starting calibration now that's looking at transmission, so, and then connect the two, basically, and the transmission model does have a lot of um, granularity in terms of age, risk, uh, location, uh, workplaces, households, like all those kind of things. So I think, yes, at some point, so first you want to get it all running and connected, but I think the behavioral stuff is what is really, really interesting on a population level, but you know, like I'm just mentioning it here now for the PPE in a hospital, but I think at a population level, it's really interesting too. So here we go. You have differential equations of agent-based simulation. So it's close to our differential equations. So I don't see any uh, additional questions. So uh, Kuma, so is that okay that we uh, thank Beata again and uh, thank you again for, for the presentation and also for your leadership uh, uh, in Ontario's modern activities. Thank you. Thanks so much, John. Thanks so much Kuma, for the invitation and thanks everyone for listening. Thanks. Okay, so we'll see everybody uh, back uh, next week then. Bye. Thanks so much. Bye.